Hello, hello. Now it's much better. Thank you, Pastor Tom. Thank you for uh, such a warm invitation. And thank you for the privilege of, and thank you, church, for the privilege of being able to share the Word of God today with you. It's an honor and it's a privilege to be here. And I thank you for your hospitality and for your, for your warm uh, welcome. Um, I've known Pastor Tom and his family for many years. He's been uh, doing conferences and missions in Romania. And by the way, if you're wondering, my accent is Romanian. So I hope, I hope you'll be able to understand me. So he, Tom and Julie and his family, they've been doing missions in Romania for many years, 10, 15 years. And that's where I met them. And then he's been my professor in uh, the Bible College, Grace College of Divinity. And when we immigrated here seven years ago, they are, they've been... Him and their children, they've been like our second family here in the United States, and they helped us. They had a tremendous input in our lives along the years, in our education, spiritual growth, and I thank, I'm so grateful for them and for their input in our lives. And thank you. Thank you again, Pastor Tom. And uh, my name is Edward. For those who don't, uh, don't know me or I didn't introduce myself, uh, I've been married 12 years with a beautiful woman named Natalia, and uh, my son. I have, we have a son together of two years, two years and a half. His name is Justin Christopher. Here they are. They are not with me now. I'm by myself. I came here with work, but they are back home in Italy. Uh, and we traveled and lived all over the places in here for three years and a half, then in Dallas for two years, California two years, and Italy two years. So hopefully this year we'll be back to the States. Uh, if uh, God, God helps us. Um, praise God. So I'm, as I said, I'm honored to, pray, to share the Word of God because I am excited about the Word of God. The Word of God is my passion. You know why? Because the Word of God, it's foolishness for other people who don't know God, but for us who believe, it is the power of God for change, for salvation, for healing, for protection, for uh, 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 holiness, uh, and uh, the word of the cross, it's our power. It's the power of God in our lives. And as Pastor Tom said, as a church, we are in, for those who were not here last Sunday, we are in a series called Operating System. And as it happens, I'm an IT guy. And I, I understood that there are a lot of IT guys in this area. So that's my area of expertise, IT, or operating system, databases mainly. And I got in conflict with a few guys here. <laughs> the storage guys. <laughs> um... <laughs> um uh, and most of you probably know that any operating system for computers or for phones, for our phones, it's, it acts like a framework or a container, a wrapper of all the other applications that we use for our practical lives. Isn't that right? So the operating system is the base that gives us opportunity to use other applications. So whenever your operating system is slow and has bugs or has security vulner vulnerabilities and you, viruses can come in, what happens? All your other applications are negatively affected. Isn't that right? And you are not able to function. You'll have slowdowns. You'll have all kinds of weird messages coming up to you. Windows will load up very slow. So your whole life indirectly will be affected. Your work, your e efficiency, your quality of life, you will not be able to function, right? So in the same way, Pastor Tom introduced last, last Sunday uh, that... In a similar way, our character and self-control, the level of self-control in our lives, acts like an operating system. And I have to watch my time. Uh, uh, acts exactly like an operating system for all the other deeds, activities, ministries that we do in our lives. So whenever there are holes in our character, in our self-control, things are not good. And Pastor Tom introduced, uh, generally speaking, generally the, the area of self-control last, last time, and he was... Uh, quoting the, he was talking from Proverbs 25, verse 28. If you can put it that, it would be great. I will read it. It says this, A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. And if you remember, he was talking about uh, the walls of the city and how important are the walls of a city. And whenever um, someone breaks through those walls, the city is defeated. So, uh, and today we are going to talk about a more specific area of self-control, and that is how to keep your cool, how to not have a bad temper, how to deal with a bad temper, with anger, outbursts, and how to, if you have a problem in that area, you see that more often happening in our lives. This is what we're going to talk about today, and our main passage is from Proverbs 16.32, which says this, 
Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Other translations say, say, say this verse. And he who is able to control his temper is better than one who takes a city. You can be filthy rich. You can, be, you can have a lot of accomplishes, accomplishments in life, in ministry, and do all kinds of charitable things. But if you have a problem in the area of self-control, it will not do you any good. It will cast a shadow on everything you do. It will undermine everything you are, your whole being. It will cast a shadow of shame, a shadow of, of, uh, of shame in everything you do. Because, and self-control, Pastor Thomas says, self-control is so vital in our lives and it's usually the most difficult to acquire, to acquire a godly character, to build. Self-control is not something that comes uh, overnight. Self-control is something that you build day by day, day and night. You build and you are all, in a continuous manner, you are involved in building your self-control and building your defense, your city, your walls, the, the walls of your city. And if you, if you have... A problem in that area, then it doesn't do, you need to, you need to by the grace of God, to, to ask Him to help you to grow. Amen? And today, we're, uh, my first point today, what I want to talk about before we get to the solution, what are the common roots or common causes of anger? Why do we get angry and where do we usually get angry? There, I could find three places where do we usually get angry in our family. In our, with our kids, with our, wife, with our spouse, wife, husband, then in our workplace, with our colleagues, with our bosses, and in the church, with our brothers and sisters, with our leaders, pastors, because we're humans, and there's always an opportunity to get angry on someone, uh, and to, to, to be angry on someone. And there can be multiple external reasons for you to get angry, like stress, financial uh, reasons, or maybe you, are, um, over, you have overwhelming requirements of time, of energy at work, in, in the family. But the, all these are external ones, are, are not that important. What I, wanted, I want us to talk today is to, and to do, to do is to go a little bit deeper and to look at the internal causes and the spiritual causes of anger. Because those just push our buttons, that just stir up what is already inside of us, what, what is in, in the problems that are inside of us. So the first cause, of, I have three, three pairs of twins, uh, three main causes of anger. The first pair of twins is pride and selfishness. What do I mean by that? By that? You will see, I will smile, but some, some things will be maybe uncomfortable, but it's not just you. I'm talking here, but I'm facing the same issues that you face every day. So pride and selfishness, what does it mean? It means that I love myself too much. I value my opinion and my perspective on everything above everybody else's opinion. So what, that, what, does it ha what, what happens? Whenever someone crosses you or says something different, you have an opportunity to get angry. Even if you don't say anything, you're like... You're, Boiling inside, right? Am I right? So, and I met so many people like this, and to, I met also a lot of gray hair people, uh, people in, the, in the old age, who, who were supposed to be like at a certain level of maturity, you know? <laughs> and that you would see them getting angry on even small things, like, and even on kids, you know? And I was looking at them, you, know, you have so many years, you've walked with the Lord, and how can you, how, uh, I mean, you have some certain expectations. And I've, I've noticed something in life, and I, I, I'm still testing it. But you see, if, if you don't change while you're, like, uh, while you're younger, the more you advance in age, it will become more difficult for you to change. And the worst part of it is that you will start, you'll begin to not see it anymore. Others will see it around you, but you will not see it. And when they try to tell you something, then you, you burst out. You don't want anyone to touch you. And that's, I think, most prevalent. I see it in my life. I see it in so many people. It's like, self, it's, I've, I, 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 do, I do things the best way. I know best. I know better than my wife. I know better than my husband. I know better than my boss. I know better than my pastor, than my leader. Uh, he doesn't know anything. Or he knows something, but I am better. 
So we don't say that, but in our minds, we so many times think, think like that. And that's a main reason why we get angry. And we, maybe if we say what? Second pair of, of twins, it's insecurity and jealousy. And if you remember, King Saul is a, a good example of this. King Saul with David. You know when God appointed David, anointed David to be king? And King Saul got angry on him, got jealous on him. Why? Because King David started fighting the battles, started having victories. So, and women were starting, were beginning to shout that Saul was, has killed the thousands and David killed the tens of thousands. So Saul was looking from a window and looking at this. And instead of rejoicing that he has such a great man under, in his army that uh, fights his battles, he doesn't have to go to battle. Instead of rejoicing, he begins to get angry. Why? Because he lost the trust in God and, him, and in himself. He felt threatened. So now they are saying this. Uh, tomorrow they will say something more. And the next day he will be king. And, I mean, what can you do? If God chose him to be king, can you fight against that? I mean, it's foolishness, no? You can fight all you want. If God chose that person, you know, if there's no reason for you to be jealous. Yes, maybe it's uncomfortable to hear certain things. But we have to grow in maturity and, um, and welcome. If someone is better than us, and I have to learn to welcome if something, uh, someone is better than me. Maybe he has a better point of view than me. So he was sitting and looking at that. And you know, when, when you are jealous and insecure, I met a lot of people like that. And I've been one. And by the grace of God, I... I think I grew a little bit in that, but I met a lot of people like that. And you know, the first sign of a jealous and insecure person is that they take everything personally. You go and tell them something like the smallest, the smallest disagreement or the, the smallest correction, and they will just, uh, they will take it personally. Oh, what, what, what do you mean? What, uh, what do you mean? Am I be, uh, uh, was I like that? Are you referring to me? I mean, all these kinds of things, you know? And maybe the person doesn't even think about that. He, the person just said something in general, but you take it personally, like Saul did. I mean, women, I don't think they thought about Saul, what he was, because if they knew, maybe they wouldn't have said it. <laughs> but they, I don't think they had in their mind that Saul would get angry. But Saul took it personally. And I want to give a heads up, to, to, especially to men. I heard, I'm not there yet, but I heard that around the 40s, uh, there is kind of a crisis of identity, an identity crisis. So you might be more prone to feel insecure in your family, in your, in your workplace. Some other young people come with more knowledge than you, and you are outdated, and you are not so high-tech so high like other people are, and you might feel inferior and insecure. You lose your trust in God. You lose your trust in yourself. But let's look at this situation. Whose fault was that Saul, whose fault was in all this situation with Saul and David? Was it God? Was it David to blame? Or Saul? For his, for his uh, bad temper, for his uh, anger. Saul, of course. And you know, my, my father-in-law has a, a, a funny saying. He says, when it seems that you have a lot of problem with a lot of people around you, check that you are not the problem. <laughs> you know? Uh, because most of the time, you might be the problem if you have a problem with everyone, right? And uh, I, I always laugh at that when I remember. He, 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 told it, he, he told me and he told my wife and that's why, while she was young. Um, so what was, trying, what was Saul trying to accomplish by, fi by fighting David? Could he have accomplished some, anything? Did he accomplish anything by fighting David, by being angry on him? No, of course not. He only lost, he only, he only he allowed insecurity and jealousy to tear down the walls of his self-control, of, uh, of his security. And what happened? He accelerated his downfall. Whenever you allow things like that in your character to take control of you, you are on the path to downfall. You are accelerating your downfall and, and shame. So that's what happened to Saul. He finally... Sadly, he ended up being killed, killing himself and being defeated in battle. And that, he didn't get there overnight. It was a process. 
where he allowed things like that, small things like that, and in the beginning, he allowed them, oh, it's just an anger, it's just an outburst, and it's nothing. No, it's something, because that grows into something that can take control of you. And there, what I want to say today in this area, and I'll close with this, uh, I'll finish with this pair of tun- twins, is that no one can take your place. There's no reason to compete with anyone. Or to compare yourself with anyone. You know why? Because when God created each and every one of us, He created us uniquely. He put us in us uniquely desire, unique desires. And he, he designed a unique plan for our lives. He designed what we will accomplish, what is our inheritance, what is our part to play in the kingdom and in the world. And no matter how, how you think, nobody can take your place. You know, sometimes we compare with other people. And I used to compare myself with other people, like great men of God, having multitudes of people, preaching to multitudes. Of, and that was my dream. And it has, it's still my dream. What did I do? Okay. <laughs> uh, and it's still my dream. But you know what? Even if my part is smaller, and I may never speak to a stadium, stadium of people, if God allotted me to do just that, and I do it 100%, I will receive the same reward as the guy who preaches to the multitudes. We don't have to be deceived by the appearances or by the exterior things. Just be secure, be confident, and focus on what has been allotted to you. Leave other people be, even if they seem better than you, even if they seem to have more success. You know, success can be here today and tomorrow. It's like... So don't look at that. When you are with God, when you focus on your, work, on your relationship with God in growing in character, so the Bible says that we have good success. And that, what does it mean? It's not a success that comes and goes. It's a consistent and uh, continuous success because God, when God blesses and gives favor, nothing can touch that. So focus on you. No, no one can take your share. Your share of people, your share of inheritance, your share of reward. No one can take that in ministry, at work. And, you know, it's so, uh, it's a paradox. Because the more you struggle to get somewhere, the more you get angry, the more you lose. The more you try to control things, like the the sand, it more slips through through your fingers. The more you relax and sit back, yeah, allow people to be better than you at work, in the church. Allow them to grow together with you. The third pair of uh, twins, it's identity misplacement and perfectionism. And that describes me, describes me uh, a few years back. I, I've been a worship leader and worship pastor for many years. In my, my dad is a pastor, and probably you, you could say I'm a PK, a uh, pastor's kid. Uh, and I've been leading worship for many years. And you know, in my beginning years, and some of you might experience that, whenever you are in front here in, in the sta- on the stage, there's a big temptation to, uh, in the name of God, that you are doing something from the Lord, and it has to be perfect. Everything has to be perfect. Uh, you, you put your identity and your satisfaction and everything you are in that ministry. And whenever... Things don't go the way you want them to go, you get angry. And that's what I did. Whenever, whenever I, would, I would do worship concerts, I would work a lot and sweat and prepare. And in the day of the concert, something breaks or someone does something or someone is not there on time. And I got angry so many times. But you know, deep inside of me, I knew that that's not good. That's not godly. No matter how much I fancy myself that I do it for God, it wasn't God. It was for myself. Because at the end, I would receive the praises. Oh, you, you sang so nice. You played, so you know, that solo, and the, I play keyboards and guitar. You know that, oh, that's amazing. And people come to you, and, and that's fine. But you know, at a certain point, you start living for those praises. And whenever things don't go your way, you get angry because you place your identity in your ministry. You place that. Some people place their identity in their work. Everything is work. Their passion is there. And when their colleagues don't behave the same way, don't put the same energy and time as you do, what happens? You get angry. You lose your temper. 
uh, on, a, or on some, somebody. So it's, and it took me years to take my identity from that ministry from, and from ministry in general. You know how God did it? <laughs> he put me in a place where I was anonymous and I didn't have any ministry for years, for a few years. And I had to learn to just be content with God just by myself and to find my identity in God, who I am in Christ, who he made me to be, a beautiful creature, a new creation. No matter if I minister or I don't minister, my satisfaction, my identity is in God. And if you are, a, in, and if you are also a perfectionist on top of that, things get ugly. Because if you are a perfectionist and your whole identity is in something, everything has to be perfect. And when it doesn't, you get angry. Now, let's focus on understanding the consequences. What happens when you get angry? Because that will answer the question, why would you want to change? Why is it so important to change and grow in, in self-control? And, what are the, and uh, to answer that question, I'll talk a bit of, of a few consequences very briefly. The first thing that happens when you get angry and you lose your temper, you grieve the Holy Spirit. God has given His most precious possession to live in you. His Holy Spirit, by which He did everything in this universe. You know? And on top of that, He made you His son and daughter. You know, the whole heaven, the, all the angels, all the demons, all the devil himself, they all know you are the Son of God. You know, one day we will judge angels. They look to us with respect. Whenever you lose your temper in a childish way, you bring shame to your father. Uh, you, 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 you taint that reputation. God cannot boast with you. All the creatures of heaven. And God wants to boast with us. God wants to brag with us like he did with Job. Like he did with so many people of faith in the Bible. And when you behave like that, you grieve him. You know what grief is? It's not offense. It's not that he's angry on you. What is grief for a parent? Whenever your son and daughter goes astray, what is grief? It's a pain that comes out of love, that you see your son or daughter destroying themselves. It's a pain. It's something that it pains you. It's not anger. God is not angry only because his anger was on Christ. But whenever we behave like that, we bring, we bring we, uh, shame to uh, our father to, uh, in front of all the creatures, he, in front of all the heavenly creatures. Second, second thing, what happens? You hurt others around you, and usually they are the dear ones, the, the dear people, the, your family, your kids, you, you hurt your brothers and sisters, and finally, you hurt yourself the most. You know why? Because after you lost your temper, you will feel awful, because you have the Holy Spirit in you, and you'll start feeling guilty. You will not be able to connect with God. It will take some time for you to take, say I'm sorry and be able to fellowship again with the Lord. And you'll feel miserable. But on top of that, that's about yourself. But what happens is that you become paralyzed and ineffective in helping others in the kingdom. Because when you, when you do those things, your faith is affected. It's hard for you to believe for someone else. It's hard for you to minister. Whenever you are asked, please pray for me. Come and pray for me. You know what comes first? Oh, but you cannot. Oh, you remember what you did like a few, a few moments ago? Or sometimes in the car before you come to church, you, you argue with your wife, with your kids, and, or maybe when you leave, and the devil has a talent of bringing back that when, when it happened, when you were, uh, were ready to minister. So it affects your faith. It, it makes you ineffective. And also, it casts a, sh a, a, a shadow. It casts shame on you and your ministry and your testimony in front of other people that don't know Christ. You know, you, you, if they saw you, and you know people are watching. You may think they're not, but they're watching you every day at work. They watch you. And whenever, whenever you lose your temper, then it's very hard for you to preach Christ to them. Um, so... Uh, that these are a few of the consequences. And uh, lastly, I want to touch on how to overcome anger. How to grow. How can we grow in this area to build so that we, we are refrained we are and it becomes part of our nature. It's not something that is temporary here and there, but it's something that becomes part of you. And um, uh, as you might know, any long-term uh, significant change, if you want to really change, 90% uh, of the change takes place in the mind. 
The rest is logistics. But you have to change something in the mind. And the Bible puts so much emphasis on renewing our minds because in, in, and in any area of change, if you want to change something in you, it's, uh, you may try to patch it from outside now, uh, as much as you want. It may last for a few weeks, for a few days, months, years. I don't know how strong you are, but ultimately it will come back if you don't do a change in the mind. For instance, in the area of weight loss, I've, I've done exercise in gym for years. I used to run like hours on a treadmill to lose weight. But you know, until you change something in your mind regarding eating and dieting, you will just keep yourself floating <laughs> at a certain level. You have to change something in your mind. So what, I have five, uh, five points, five ways that we can grow. And the first one is know that you can keep your cool. Based on the word of God that he has spoken about us as new creations, know and believe that you can. I hear so many people saying, oh, it's just that what I am. I cannot control myself. That's who I am. Or other people say about you, oh, that's how he is. Just, just let him be. Uh, you, you know what that means? Have you heard this saying? That? You know what that means? It means that let him be, accept him as he is. He cannot change. And what it implies, it means that there is something outside of you or something that you, can, you don't have control over that makes you get angry. And you, can, you don't have any control of it. you just like this. You'll, you'll continue to be angry and to have a bad temper and you lose your cool all your life. And that's a lie. It's a lie from the devil. And it's the same mindset of a drug addicted or an alcoholic. You know what? The, what is the power of an addiction? That you will never really be free. You cannot be free. It's something outside of your reach. And that's not true. Because God... The moment, the moment you became a new creation in Christ Jesus, He has given us everything that we need pertaining to life in God. Let's read the passage from 2 Peter 1, verses 3 to 9. It says this, His divine power has granted to us all, thing, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him, who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this reason, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement or to add, supplement your faith, add to your faith virtue, and with virtue, knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and so on. So there are two things here that I want, you to, I want us to notice this morning. One is that God in the past tense has granted, has given us everything we need pertaining to life and to live a godly life. He has given us His Word. He has given us His Holy Spirit. He has given us eternal life. Jesus Christ died for us. He has given us everything, all the tools that we need. And then He says, because of this, this very reason, make every effort to add self-control to your faith. That means you can. If you couldn't, God would, have, would not have put that word in there. That means you can. You have to destroy that lie in your mind. Every time it happens, oh, I'll never get over this. Oh, that's, that's it. And especially if you have your parents or your, your family siblings being like that all their lives, you have a stronger, you have to defeat a stronger stronghold in your mind. Say, no, I can. God can through me. His grace is more than enough for me to overcome. And there are so many verses that, that talk about Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Romans 6, 14, sin shall not have dominion over you because you are under grace. What is sin? Anger, it's a sin. Anger will not have dominion over you because why? You are under grace. Grace is the power of God to make you walk in holiness, to help you walk in holiness. Romans 8, 37, for in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Uh, 1 John 4, 5, 4, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quoting a few, for everyone who has been born of God 
overcomes the world, overcomes sin, overcomes anger. Overcome, and what is the victory? And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Faith in what God has spoken about. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old things passed away. The new has come. Old habits, old things are passed away. But you have to believe this. In when you meet the situation, you have to, and you see, change happens both proactively and reactively. So you have to prepare. You have to prepare in advance. It's an everyday life. You don't change or grow in the moment when you're faced with a temptation. You grow in your mind. You change. You renew your mind before you get there. And when you renew your mind, the grace of God is released in your life to, to help you change. And uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. A lot of people might not like this verse, but it says this. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. And God is faithful, and he will not let you be, let you be tempted beyond your ability. And with the temptation, he prepared a way for you to get out and to be able to endure it. So it's possible. Anything is possible, Mark 9, 23 says. It's possible. You know, the only reason that you might feel overwhelmed and helpless it's because we have two minds and some of you know that we have the conscious mind and we have the unconscious mind and in the unconscious mind uh, if if some of you uh, listen to carolyn leaf she's a very famous doctor uh, in the science of the brain and the mind and i like her sessions i like very much but she talks about the conscious mind and unconscious mind some interesting facts and all the all the habits all the, there, there are some, this unconscious mind runs 99.9% .9 of everything you are. And the rest is your conscious mind. So your mind, the mind that needs to be renewed is not your conscious mind necessarily. It's the, the, the habits, the unconscious mind, which you penetrate a little bit harder. Because it, there are habits and things that you build in years. Long-term memory, feelings, habits, and the moment you, you build those habits, they start running your life. And that's why you feel overwhelmed because you build some habits that there are some like uh, automatic pilots. It's like, uh, uh, you, and you have like systems. And they, uh, that's why you feel the urge to do certain stuff because you build that into you. So it takes time to amend. And she says that the conscious mind runs about 2,000 operations per second while the unconscious mind runs... 400 billions operations per, uh, per second. That's a quantum speed. Nobody in this world was able to, to, to reproduce this speed. And she said that we are like one foot in the spiritual realm and with one foot with the conscious mind in the material world because the, the way the unconscious mind functions, it's spiritual. It's like there's no distance, there's no space. Like 400 billions operations per second is... It's more than the speed of light, and it's like all together. So that's why you need to change, you need to penetrate, and it, you penetrate that unconscious mind through your conscious mind by being exposed to the word like, like we do now, by listening to the truth, to the word of God, and destroying lies. And then, and it doesn't happen overnight. That's the problem because you have to refresh and refresh and re meditate. That's why the Bible says meditate. On the word. You have to refresh every day. When you remember. And when you remember about this. You, especially if you have a problem about that. You have to collect all the verses that talk about this. And meditate on them. And declare them. Um, so and Carolyn Leaf says that. Uh, to, to destroy uh, a habit or a wrong thought. It takes about three cycles of 21 days. To destroy only one thought. So it's, it's not something that happens quickly, but it's possible. And it, you can do it. And I want to give an example here, uh, and that will elucidate what I'm talking about. You know slavery in the United States and communism in Eastern Europe. I've been in communism, so it's kind of a parallel example. But you know when slavery was abolished and was given like a decree, from now on, from this day onward... Uh, there are no more slaves. You masters, you need to re re deliver your slaves and uh, le let them free. You know, a lot of masters kept it quiet. And a lot of slaves didn't know. It took a hundred years to implement that law into practice. 
But the, more than this, whenever a slave would get out of, of his master, you know, slavery was abolished from the outside. The power of slavery was abolished. But it, took, it takes years to get the slavery mentality out of you. And, and I experienced that when I came out of communism. You, you, are, you are used with certain things to do. You are, you are, for instance, a slave. He will never rest. He will always be involved looking for his master going. He will not, have, he will not be free to choose what to eat, where to go, the freedom of, ch- uh, of choice. He will not think of himself too much. He will think of his master. So it will take time to know all, all of a sudden, oh, I can rest. I can sleep as much as I want. I don't have to go to work today. I mean, it takes time until you change. And that's exactly what happened to us. When we were saved, our spirits have been recreated. They are holy. They are righteous. But our minds and our bodies still are catching up. And we, that's, that's why the Bible says renew our minds. So uh, when, uh, I want you to, at this point, believe and know that you can. Second, confess what the Word says. You know, what is the moment... Where the greatest power of God, the moment in your life when the greatest power of God was manifested. Which, which moment do you think it is? The moment of salvation. What happened then? You, you were transferred, Colossians 1.13, from darkness to light. From death to life. Your whole spirit has been recreated. And that's... that's you have been resurrected to life, to the life of God, to, to be alive to righteousness. That's the greatest miracle and the greatest power is manifested at that moment. You don't see it outside, but that's what happened in the natural, in the spiritual. In a second, a split second, you have become a son of God who is seated with Christ in the, uh, in the heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. You have received authority over devils, over the world, over habits, sinful habits, over uh, sinful things. And in, in a split second, how did you get there? Romans 10, 9 to 10 says this. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth he confesses and is saved. So you believed, and then you spoke. And that speech, that declaration, got you saved. In the same way, we believe, and what the verses that I said, we declare. There was a song here saying, we declare God is our victory, and He is here. Declaration and confession has a huge role. That's what gives us. So whenever, before you get to the moment of temptation, take time to declare those verses to personalize to you. Like I did. Sin does not have dominion over me because I am under grace. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's no temptation that will overtake me beyond my ability. And God who is faithful has prayed. That's how I pray. That's how you should pray. And you strengthen yourself. And whenever you cannot, whenever you face temptation, you cannot not remember what you have declared, what you built inside of you. And that's when you speak those things. You speak the word of God, which releases grace and power to change. Third thing, third, the, the, the rest of the steps are, are shorter. Learn, the third one, learn to hate the source and, and the consequences of bad anger. What is the source of anger? It's an effect of sin entering into the world. It's a, an act of darkness. It comes from the devil. Yeah, we might do it, and not, it's not always the devil making us angry. In fact, most of the times. But acting in, losing our temper, it's an act of darkness, and that should make you angry, angry in a holy way. Like, I need to solve this. I need to. I cannot continue to do this because God, my Father, loves me. My Father wants me to walk like Him, to represent Him with honor. Anger never, never, never brings anything good out of it. If you think you bring, it will bring something, it will never bring anything good out of it. Even when you feel that you were right or lost something, you didn't lose anything. Fourth step, for a way to grow is deter, determine to make Jesus your role model. What I mean by that is think about Jesus. He endured the cross. He endured beatings. He endured insults. He was mocked. 
He was and unjustly. Because here we have a problem. When we feel like we are justified, we are right. We are justified to be angry. No, you're not justified. Jesus didn't retaliate, didn't say a word. Didn't, he endured it, and he, was, he, he refrained, he controlled himself, and he suffered. And you, we have to, together, we have to make a resolution. No matter what, I will stay calm. No matter what, I decide to, to I take a strong decision. Decision that in no circumstance I will not retaliate. I will not get angry. And speak to yourself. I speak in front of a mirror sometimes. You, you, Edward, you will not retaliate from now on. You speak to yourself. And the last one, learn to say, I'm sorry. That's the fastest way to regain confidence and security. Learn to say, I'm sorry. So many people, to so many people, it comes so difficult to say, I'm sorry. If you already lost it, you had an outburst of anger. The Holy Spirit will immediately tell you, remind you, what did you do? So immediately, no matter who you got angry on, on your wife, usually it's your wife or your husband. Go immediately. That's what I learned to do, and it's successful, 100%. Immediately. Honey, I'm really sorry that I, I got angry on you. I want to change. I shouldn't have acted. You are maybe right. Well, I, I might be right. I don't know. But the matter of fact, I should not react that way. Even if I'm right or you're right, I'm sorry for reacting in that way. Please forgive me. And at first, it might seem difficult, but then you... It becomes so easy, and you know, so many people became angry on me because I said I'm sorry. You, what, you know why? <laughs> because they say, the moment you say I'm sorry, I cannot do anything to you. I mean, what can I do to you? I can, can I take your head? I mean, don't say I'm sorry. I want to be angry on you. You know, when, when the moment you say I'm sorry, you place the ball in the other person's court. <laughs> you know? And it's so relieving. It's so, it feels so good. Even at work, in so many situations, people get angry. They, they are insecure. Job security. They, they, you know, when I came to my company, they were so surprised that I was open and transparent with everything. I mean, somebody would ask me, how do you do that? Oh, here, here it is. This is how you do it. Because everyone would keep their, would not share their knowledge because they were afraid of losing their job. I don't know. I just came, I shared everything, I did documentation, I put everything online. And the more I did that, <laughs> the more my job be, uh, became secure. Because everybody wants me. I, and it's not, it's not something to brag about. It's just the grace of God. The more relaxed you are, the more you're willing to say, I am sorry to your wife. And I, uh, I'll give you my secret for a successful marriage. And man, you might not like it, but... Now it's women's time. <laughs> uh, you know, Ephesians 5.25, I'm talking about, I'll, I'll finish with three examples. Uh, in the family, in ministry, at work. You know, in family, Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved his church and gave himself up for the church. You know what that means to me? That whenever a conflict happens in the family between me and my wife, no matter who is to blame, I, the man, need to follow Christ and take initiative. Take initiative and say, I'm sorry. It's the hardest thing to do, I know. But you know how successful it is? Because then it's like you create a, like a circle. The more you say, I'm sorry, the more the wife will say, I'm sorry. Then the more the wife will say, I'm sorry, the more you will say it. And things will, I have never had a conflict staying with my wife more than a few hours. I mean, a few hours exaggerated. In 12 years. Because that's a secret. You give yourself up. Even if you weren't right. You were right. You take initiative as a man. You have responsibility over your wife. That doesn't mean women are, not, are uh, ex exempted. But man, you need to take initiative. It's hard, but then you learn to do it so easily, and it's, it brings so much life and peace into your family. You wouldn't believe it. 
That's what I live. What I'm telling you is something that's successful. Then at, uh, in ministry, a few, a few months ago, I mean a, a year and a half, in Italy, I've been, I've been in, uh, I am, I've been in, a, in leadership, an elder in the church, and uh, a new pastor came, an Italian. And over the course of that, he inherited me and another elder, another leader. And there, there came a point where he wanted to do some things, and the rest of the leadership didn't agree, didn't see the same way. And we had like a, a little bit of tension in our staff meeting, and we discussed, we set our point of view in a calm way. No, not with, but uh, things got a little bit excited. <laughs> and um, we said, Pastor, it's good what, what you want to say, but we see, we've been here in the ch- and we see this more of a need of something else. Anyway, and the meeting didn't end in the, uh, in the best way that we have wanted. And we, I was feeling so bad, and, other, and the other leader was feeling so bad. So after an hour after we finished the meeting, you know what I did? I called him and I said, Pastor, look, we said our, we, we have a responsibility to, to say what the Holy Spirit, what we think it's best for the church. And we said it, but ultimately you have the final authority. And if I offended in any way, if I said something, please forgive me. It's not now I'm out of my, out of your way and I will support you, whatever you decide. But I want a things between us to be okay, to be peaceful. You know how much he appreciated, how much it, it, it just put the fire off. Put the fire off. And the same in, in, in your work. And I'll close with, it. when someone takes your promotion, you've been wanting and waiting, and so many times it happens that someone else who doesn't even deserve it, in your perspective, takes your promotion. Psalm, you come with the word. Psalm 75. 6 to 7. For promotion doesn't come from the east or from the west. But God is the judge. And he puts down one and lifts up another. And you take that and declare that for you. And don't get angry. Wait. It's just a matter of time. Things can change in a day. It's just temporary. You have the ultimate upper hand. Amen? So I want to close with this. And as the worship team comes up, I want us to pray. I hope that by the Word of God, by the Holy Spirit, I created that desire and, hang, uh, and hunger to change. To, to, if you have a, a, a bit of a problem in that area, to become calm. So that people say, what happened with you? What, this person has changed. What happened? And then you can testify. The power of God changed me. The power of God changed me. And I am able now to, to control myself and to... To, to be usable, to be a, a vessel of honor in God's hand. And you'll see, you will be more used by the Holy Spirit whenever you feel those holes, those vulner, uh, vulnerabilities, uh, those things that drag you down. Amen? Let's pray. Let's stand. And you can repeat after me. You can pray in your personal. Have a personal prayer with God and talk to Him from the heart. Father God, thank You for Your Word. Thank You that You're such a good Father. And You've given me so much. I have no excuse. And I'm really sorry for all the moments when I lost it, when I, I lost my temper. I, and I hurt other people. And I disgraced you and I brought shame to you Father I am really sorry but from today onwards Father I need your help I need your grace and I want I want to grow and I pray that you would help me that you would strengthen me in that area of anger Father I pray that right now by your Holy Spirit that you would change something significant in me in my mind in my habits in my you you would perform a significant change Father I pray right now help me strengthen me so that I would be a good testimony to people into the kingdom of God so that I will bring you honor father I pray and I believe that by your holy spirit I will be able to walk in newness of life to walk in self-control father I worship you thank you 
thank you that you've given me everything that I need. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word. Thank you for life. Join with me as we sing this song in response to what God is speaking to us. Walked away. 